Death Don't Us Part by Olaf Bauman. Interior, exterior, busy intersection, BMW day. Heavy traffic. A BMW stops for a red light. The driver's sad eyes stare in the rearview mirror. He spots a rusty subcompact crammed full with a wildly celebrating wedding party. They scream with joy when they pop the cork on a champagne bottle and the liquid sputters. They hoot when the groom French kisses the bride. Exterior, country club, gate, day, flashback. Police in riot gear face a furious crowd of screaming girls. They carry signs reading, this marriage is illegal. Charlie belongs to us. Kill the bitch. Faint opening bars of Wagner's wedding march whip the girls into outraged insanity. Exterior, country club, Rose Garden Day. A celebrity wedding. From decor to guests, everything is flashy, shiny, overdone, and outrageously expensive. Dawn, a middle-aged press photographer, snaps pictures of triumphant Emma, end 20s. Good-looking, but not beautiful. Her wedding gown is fit for a princess. Daddy, 60s, grinds his teeth as he leads Emma down the aisle. All he wants is my money. He snorts like a failing steam engine and inhales a pop from his nitro spray. Oh, don't you worry, Daddy. As soon as you're dead, it's my money. Charlie, 30s, waits at the altar. His looks are so breathtakingly perfect as if gay couturiers had created him in their secret gene laboratory. He smiles at Emma. Is me gorgeous? All those crazy bitches want him, but I got him, and I won't let him go. He's mine. Journalist Dina, 30s, radiating desperate dissatisfaction, grunts when Charlie smiles for Don's telelens. Yeah, I get pimples every time this mindless dimwit grins into some fucking camera. Have you heard that stupid new song? His voice is so sweet they should declare him patron saint of Carrie's. Don snaps pictures. Happy Emma. Grumpy Daddy. Happy Charlie. Roscoe, a slightly sleazy music producer, 40s, is the best man. He wears a tuxedo with red sneakers. Listen to that fucking riot! We're gonna lose the audience if you say yes! With her money I can make my own label. And then, I make my own music. And then I'm gonna fire you. Fuck your music! You're not a fucking musician! You're a star! I made you a star! I can't let you do that! With a pompous gesture, he swallows the wedding ring. Charlie stares at him. He produces a spare from his pocket. I know you. Fuck! Roscoe spits out the wedding ring he has hidden in his cheek. Exterior, country club, gate, day. The furious girls let loose a cacophony of screams and break down the barriers. The phalanx of officers brace for impact. From the looks on their faces, they know they will lose this fight. Exterior, country club, rose garden, day. Emma reaches Charlie. He enjoys the noise of his fans. Isn't that romantic? They all want me, but all I want is you. Let's make it official. Emma motions Charlie to turn to the minister. And so I ask you, Charlie, will you take Emma as your lawfully wedded wife? Love her, cherish her, give up for her all the other crazy girls who pelt you with panties wherever you perform on stage. Will you trash your guitar, give up music, stay at home in short, will you kiss your life goodbye and only live for her? What? That's a yes. No. Emma whips around like a furious dervish. She kicks Charlie in the groin. He groans, fights for air. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. He said yes. Emma throws a straight punch at Charlie. He crashes into the front row of guests. Chairs disintegrate, people fall, and the whole row crumbles. Daddy smiles proudly to his neighbor. I'll take his signature on the prenup. Emma chases after Charlie. Another punch sends him tumbling down the aisle. She drags Charlie to an elaborate wedding cake. You say yes, and I say yes, and now you're going to kiss the bride! Emma slams his head repeatedly into the cake, transforming it into a gooey mess. She slaps Charlie, who chokes on whipped cream. She rams his head into a gigantic glass bowl of punch. Charlie drowns in punch. Air bubbles escape his mouth. He forms a word, but nothing can be heard. He won't get any greener. Go, for heaven's sakes, we're late for lunch! 
Interior, exterior, busy intersection, BMW day, and flashback. Charlie yanks up with a scream. He clutches the wheel of the BMW. The woman next to him is Emma. Tanya is waiting. They are both 15 years older. The BMW stands motionless before a green traffic light. Charlie's fellow motorists honk horns and scream abuse. The light turns red. Tanya, here we come. He steps on it. The BMW zooms forward, tires screech, and the BMW T-bones cross traffic. A battered rim rolls down the street. Exterior, intersection day. Police officer Steve walks around the wreck of the BMW and fills out a form. Charlie and Emma casually lean against a police cruiser and watch him. You could have killed us. What were you thinking? Funny. I was thinking about cake and punch. She wants to respond, but Steve presents Emma the form for a signature. Would you fill that out for me, please? Don't I know you from somewhere? Of course you do. Do you want an autograph? He produces an autographed headshot. Steve admires it. You're an actor, aren't you? No, I'm an axe murderer. I copied that picture from a wanted poster. Steve compares reality and headshot. I know. You're that, you're that guy you, girls used to be crazy about. I thought you were dead. Charlie takes in air to say something rude. Honey, please let the officer do his work. Honey, I say what I want because I'm not some dumb dude from the street. But I am the Charlie. Are you uh, having some domestic issues? No, we don't. We are a happily married couple now and forever until death does us part. My sister was crazy about you when she was in high school. I think she sent you her panties with her fan mail. And the sign so hard the paper rips. She hands the form back and whistles angrily for a passing cab. It stops. How's your sister doing? 350 pounds, five kids. Emma pushes Charlie into the cab. Is she still sending out her panties? Yes, in an emergency when tents are needed. Emma slams the door shut. The cab takes off. Interior, the house, master bedroom day. Italian designers ram a mock when they custom furnish this room. Scratch marks on the wall, a shattered lamp, a ripped to pieces cocktail dress in the trash, cracked bedposts, angry steps. Emma storms in, closely followed by Charlie. What do you want panties in the mail? Do you have some fetish issues? I am your wife. I'm real. She stares at him. He smiles diabolically. Do you know what it takes me to do a quick threesome with literally anybody I meet on the street? <laughs> snaps his fingers. That's all it takes. She slaps him. He slaps back. Their brawl quickly turns into savage sex. They rip each other's clothes off, bite, kiss, roll around. Charlie throws Emma on the bed hard. Another leg breaks, and the bed falls apart. They neither notice nor stop. Exterior, the house. Establishing shot day. A villa in a park. Noise as if giants clobber each other with tree trunks. One of Emma's shoes shatters the window. It lands on the carefully rigged driveway. Interior, the house. Master bedroom. Master bathroom, day. Charlie yawns as he scuffles to the toilet. Charlie stops dead, his gaze glued to the mirror. Something is wrong with his face. He investigates. His eyes open wide in panic. A deep wrinkle under his eye. Emma appears. She talks on the phone as she slaps his behind and disappears in the shower. Yes, Tanya, I'm sorry, but he crashed the car. Of course, afterwards he made up for it. Twice. What can I say? His dedication to duty makes up for some of his shortcomings. Listen, Tanya, can we reschedule for tomorrow? Charlie opens the cupboard. The beauty products on his shelf far outnumber those on hers. He frantically creams his face. Exterior, country club, terrace, day. Emma watches Charlie and his golf buddies through binoculars, way out on the green. Charlie says something charming to a flight of female golfers. They giggle and his buddies slap his back. Everything under control? Emma startles. With apparent disgust, she recognizes Roscoe. He wears clothes too young for his age and carefully covers a bald spot with his remaining hair. Don't sneak up on me, you sleazebag. He's still hot, isn't he? He could still be making platinum, don't you think? He's mine. 
That's why I'm here. I made a new star. I plugged him right from heaven. You should rather plug the hair from your nose. Name's Gwen. You should see that guy. Incredible. He looks like a girl. That makes the little girls crazy. Put some lipstick on him and even some of the boys consider their sexual orientation. How cool is that? And you're telling me so I can get crazy about him before all the others do? I need a signature on a song for him. I was thinking that uh, death don't us part. Charlie did great with that song, but Gwen, oh Gwen, give that song to him and he'll just make you cherry pop. Emma stares at Roscoe. He can't hold her gaze. Listen, when they play that song on the radio, everybody still thinks Charlie. Give me that song and I guarantee you in six months, whenever they hear that song, they'll think when. And what do you think will Charlie say when I'm selling out his legacy? <laughs> legacy, please! He never had a legacy! What he had was looks. Patty wedding cherry popping, orgasmic blue kind of looks. But he didn't have the brains to see that. Wanted to be an artist, what a fucking joke. But the girls still get all excited when he says so much as hello. That must drive you nuts. Come on. That's why you killed his career after you took him away from me. You don't need him. I produce your music. What a fucking bullshit. Oblivion, here I come. You want him for yourself? You want to own him? Put him in your collection? Who gives a fuck? Be my guest. But why don't you finish the job and kill the last string that keeps him in everybody's memory? Give me that fucking song and I'll make the world forget him. You lock him up in your little shrine of domestic bliss and to keep him happy, you shove money up his ass. Everybody wins, what do you say? Emma jumps on. Or as an alternative, I could buy Scramble Records and have him fired. Roscoe retreats backwards, stumbles, slips, and falls into a koi pond. The water boils. Koi attack like hungry piranhas. Roscoe barely makes it out. Fuck, why? My little darling likes that song. He sings it in the shower every once in a while. I'd like to keep it that way. I like you better when you were giving backstage blowjobs to piss off your father. At least that was honest. Interior, country club, locker room, day. Roscoe sits on a bench and wrings water from his jacket. He smiles his brightest smile when Charlie enters. Hey, buddy! They embrace with a lot of back slapping. You're wet. Yeah, I took a swim. I didn't know they had a pool. I don't give a fuck about details. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, God, thanks for asking. Gwen is an idiot. Voice like a dying cat. Looks like a sissy. I squeeze him for all he's got. But let me tell you, it ain't much. I guess I have to throw him back into the gutter where I found him. He's not you, if you know what I mean. They're all not you. Well, who's me? Only you, buddy. Only you. You are the real deal. The one and only. The supreme. Are those wrinkles? I'm getting old. Let Roscoe have a look. Roscoe examines Charlie's face with all the care and expertise of a medical professional. You did sign a prenup, didn't you? Not really. Daddy faked my signature. Mm. We're all staring into the gaping maw of time. And your fancy-ass wife has exquisite tastes. Emma loves me. Roscoe stops his examination. Of course she does. You've given up the greatest thing on earth for her, your fans. The least she can do is love you. Until death does your part. Wasn't that the line she gave you? It's more than a line. I guess that you can take that to the bank. Never mind the prenup. You're still a cynic. I've seen life. It's messy. I tell you what. I know a couple of guys from Russia. They've kept Lenin fresh until last Tuesday. Now they want to go capitalist. They owe me. They're going to fix those wrinkles, Charlie. Let me be honest. You know, I've always been honest with you. I need you. I need you to come back. Come back? Gwen ain't gonna cut it. We need you back. I... Making little girls crazy again? Are you nuts? Roscoe, they can hardly remember my name. I might not be the brightest torch in town, but even I have noticed that rock and roll has moved on. Moved on without me. I'm a has-been from yesteryear. My fans have five kids and weigh 350 pounds. Their kids don't wet their panties for some old guy who made their mothers go ballistic. Even if I shake my butt until I'm blue in the face. That's why we cancel those Russian idiots. You're no teeny star anymore. You are a mature artist. Roscoe grabs him. Look me in the eye. Look me in the eye! Charlie looks into his eye. I make it happen. Charlie swallows. Damn, Roscoe. I wanted to move on. 
I knew that you can't be a teeny star forever. I told you that. I said, let's change direction. You said, no, just no. I begged you. But all you had to say was, all looks, but no talent. That's what you said. What can I say? I'm an idiot. Everybody knows that. I should kick you in the nuts right here and now. Roscoe pulls a contract from his jacket. He fills in a couple of blanks. Okay. If it helps, kick away. But when you're done kicking, you'll take three months and you'll write 12 original songs. Then we record them. And when we surprise the world with Mature Charlie, it'll be the greatest thing since Michael Jackson's funeral. Sign. Damn. You're serious. Of course I'm fucking serious. Sign. Who do you think I am? Some semi-senile dimwit with a bag full of promises? Sign. What does it say? What it always says. Blah, 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 bullshit, and I get 50%. We forget the old tunes. You take three months, you write 12 original songs, then we record them, and then we surprise the world with Mature Charlie. It'll be the greatest thing since Michael Jackson's funeral. Sign! Charlie hesitates. Sign the fucking contract. Charlie signs. Buddy, we've got the band back together. Exterior Country Club, Terrace Day. A waiter serves Emma a bottle of champagne. I didn't order this. The gentleman said you had a reason to celebrate. Emma frowns. Her phone rings. It displays a video feed of Roscoe showing her Charlie's signature on the contract. Champagne is on me. <laughs> Interior, the house, living room day. Charlie plays the grand piano. He desperately tries to write something original, but he ends up playing slight rhythmic variations of classic songs. Example, story, stormy weather as boogie. Emma watches him and drinks a lot. He's using you. I know. He always did. Don't worry, I use it back. Hey, that sounds great, doesn't it? Because it's stormy weather, he hits piano keys in anger. Damn! What's wrong with me? Honey, you never wrote songs. Roscoe hired people who wrote them for you. Charlie plays like a lumberjack. I don't need people. I'm Charlie. Not just any Charlie, but THE Charlie. Well then, congratulations, not just any Charlie, but THE Charlie, you just wrote Autumn Leaves. I don't know what this is, but it definitely not Autumn Leaves. Emma punches a few keys on a remote. The entertainment system plays Autumn Leaves. Charlie stops playing and closes his eyes in despair. A comeback needs more than a quick signature in a locker room. Don't tie yourself to such an egomaniac who can't tell music apart from horse dung and has no problems peddling both. Let my lords get you out of this. I don't want out. I want in. He plays, but now he can't even get the chords right. He slams the keyboard lid shut. He jumps up and pours himself a huge drink. He downs it. Emma quickly wipes away a lonesome tear. I'm a music star. Without music, I might as well go and kill myself. Why is it so important? Why can't you just be happy with what we have? We? What do you mean by we? We don't have anything. You have everything. You even own me. Why did you marry me? I didn't marry you. You married me. Is that how it was? Yes, that's how it was. They gave me songs to sing. They gave me clothes to wear. They gave me drugs. They gave me girls. And then they married me off to the highest bidder. And nobody ever took the time to ask what I want. So what do you want? Charlie swallows, thinks, grinds his teeth. Life owes me. That's your answer. Life owes you? What does life owe you? A lackey to carry your behind around? Because by yourself you can't even find the toilet? No, you owe life. All you ever had was a pretty face. And now you're getting old and wrinkly and ugly. Now you don't even have that. You're lucky that I married you, and you're even more lucky if I keep you. Charlie slaps Emma. The fight quickly develops into rough sex. Exterior, the house, day. Noise like titans whacking each other with tree trunks. Charlie's shoe crashes through the window. It splashes down into the pool. Interior, the house, bedroom, night. Soft piano music wakes Emma up. Anxiously, she investigates. Interior, the house, living room, day. Charlie at the piano. 
He doesn't notice Emma because he is busy writing an original song. It sounds quite good, actually. Emma clenches her fists and cries silent tears. Interior, Roscoe's office, day. A spacious office in shrill colors. It feels like a hip, plastic nightmare. Music awards everywhere. Emma sits before Roscoe's desk, flanked by two sleek lawyers. One lawyer nods and hands her a contract. Emma signs. As soon as she's done, Roscoe picks up the phone. Hey, Charlie, buddy, listen. The demo you sent me, it sucks. When I said mature, I didn't mean shit. Whatever, and by the way, we need to move up the recording schedule. Next week. How shall I know? I don't write music, I produce it. Well, next time, read the fine print. Love you. He hangs up and gives Emma a condescending smile. All that money and all you are is just a jealous group. You don't know what love is. I know that love is selfless. That's why I don't do love. Interior, exterior, street. Charlie's BMW, night. Emma watches Charlie driving sour-faced. It was purely a business decision. I have to make money. Your lifestyle isn't cheap, you know. It was my signature song. This song is me. What another song, Charlie grinds his teeth. I suck at writing. Emma gives him a somewhat sad pat on the back. Exterior, conference center, red carpet, car, night. Red carpet area at Gwen's tour launch party. Charlie and Emma work the red carpet, all smiles and joy. Photographers snap pictures of the happy couple. Gwen, 20s, a stylized, androgynous creature who looks more like concept art than flesh and blood, emerges from a heavenly blue stretch limo. The crowd roars. Gwen's arrival triggers a media stampede. Charlie's professional smile dies when the tension evaporates. He stands alone. Emma pulls him along. Interior conference center, auditorium night. Tables, waiters, celebrities in front of a stage dominated by giant letters. They read, Scramble Records presents Gwen, Blue-Eyed Mysteries. Emma sits with her lawyers. Charlie's place is empty. With disgust, she watches Dina at the next table, 15 years older and wider around the hips. A balding guy in his 60s fondles her knees. He gets more bold by the minute. She is too drunk to care. You know, I happen to believe in serious journalism. I love to investigate. Roscoe works the room with sleazy efficiency. He arrives at Emma's table. Where is he? He's writing. Dina senses something and eavesdrops. Funny. You know, actually, I kind of like that song he wrote. I never thought he had it in him. Buy scramble records and fire this moron. Okay, okay, just say it. Sorry. Uh, a deal is a deal. I'm wrong. All he writes is shit. Don't worry, nothing will ever see the light of day, eh? ever, even if it's good, which it is. But who gives a fuck, right? Emma responds, but Dina can't understand a word of it because balding guy gnaws on her ear. Stop that, you dumb fuck! She slaps him. He falls off the chair, holds onto the tablecloth, and takes everything down with him. Dina and Emma's eyes lock, beat. I'm a fucking lady, but you're no gentleman. Dina grins at Roscoe, Emma, and her lawyers. Sorry, where are the restrooms? I need to powder my nose if you know what I mean. Do I look like a girl guy? No, Roscoe, you look like a fucking sleaze bag. No offense, but you were asking. She stumbles off as waiters close in to clear away the mess. Ha, ha, ha. Witty as always. Do you believe that? Last week she interviewed Michael Jackson. Yes, that's right, Michael fucking Jackson, the dead one, with the help of some crack brain voodoo dude. Apparently Michael Jackson enjoys being dead. Your presence is required elsewhere. Roscoe grins all Teflon. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the show. Interior, conference center, men's room night. Dina lingers purposefully in front of the men's room. Eventually, she catches Roscoe's eye. Dina winks and motions him to come. With a what-the-heck shrug, he complies. She pulls him into the men's room. Interior, conference center, men's room stall, night. Dina pushes Roscoe into a stall and locks the door. She 
wrestles with his belt. He squeaks girlishly and resists. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Sleazebag is an acquired taste. She reaches into his pants. He grunts and gives up resistance. What's the deal with Charlie and his rich groovy? He's writing, but it won't see the light of day. Why? Her gaze painfully penetrates his brain. She massages his crotch until Roscoe decides to spill the beans. Yeah, but you, you, you can't print any of this. No, of course not. They fired me over the Michael Jackson thing. Interior, conference center, bar, night. Charlie seeks solace in a large drink, not his first one. Dina glides on a seat next to him. You gonna buy a lady a drink? You're an old lady. And you're a source of noise pollution. If I pretend I'm hurt, would that make you go away? Well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Ain't gonna happen. Where's manure? There are flies. Okay, assuming I'm the fly, you just called yourself a piece of shit. I'm drunk. Speaking of shit, Roscoe likes your new song. Charlie chokes on his drink and coughs his heart out. Dina slaps his back. <laughs> I couldn't believe it either. When have you ever written anything that wouldn't cause instant diarrhea? Charlie catches his breath. God damn, Dina. I'm too old for this shit. She looks at him surprised. What happened? You sound so... human. I can't believe I said that. What do you know about anything? During the following, all color leaves Charlie's face. Listen carefully. After the voodoo fiasco and the new story, not the usual bullshit, but something juicy, big. Something with a human touch kind of story. Fucking drama, tragedy, destroyed hope and unrequited love, that type of shit. And I want it exclusively. I? She nods. You talk to me and me only. If you divorce for her, or if you kill him, or kill both, or do harm to anyone else for that matter, before you squeeze the trigger, you call me so I can snap a picture. Divorce and kill who? Are we clear about what exclusively means? I can just walk out of here, suck a couple of dicks, and get a new job. But I'm here, but only exclusively. Do you get it? Charlie nods slowly. Dina leans toward him, but roaring applause from the auditorium drowns out her tail. Interior, conference center, auditorium night. Gwen takes the stage. The band begins to play. Death, don't do us part. Interior, conference center, kitchen day. Busy kitchen, cooks working, waiters come and go. On a cart stands a huge cake. The icing reads, Death don't us part. Charlie bursts in, closely followed by Dina, who films him with her phone. Charlie empties the bottle of whiskey he brought along. He throws the bottle against a wall. Gwen opens his blue-eyed mysteries tour with Death don't us part. Do you want to connect? comment? Oh, I can do one better. I'll give you my reaction. He grabs the cake cart and pushes it into an elevator. Interior, conference center, fly tower day. Charlie and Dina roll the cake out of the elevator and onto a lighting gallery above the proscenium. They end up right above Gwen's head. Charlie motions her to help him dump the cake on Gwen. He lifts the cake onto the railing. Now I'm making the mother of all scenes. Dump cake on him? That's your idea of for mother of all scenes? It might kill him. What kind of fucking numb nut are you? If you're lucky, that gives him a sugar addiction. And that might kill him, either through obesity or heart failure. But that'll take 30 fucking years. But I want to hurt this howling cat wrangler. He deliberately butchers my song. Oh, bullshit deliberately. They yell him, sing, and he yodels. What would you suggest? How should I know? I'm just a fucking reporter. I'm reporting what you do. How about you tell her how she hurt your soul? She clipped your wings. You just wanted to do your thing, blah, blah, blah. Because without your music, your life is meaningless. And then you divorce her and sue her for $5 million. OK, thanks. I will do that right now. Do you like Errol Flynn? <laughs> He's dead. And I'm definitely not going to do an interview with him. Charlie climbs onto the rail, grabs the rope, and jumps. Interior, conference center, proscenium, day. Like Tarzan, Charlie swings back and forth. He knocks over some gigantic scramble letters. The letters obliterate stage lighting and sound equipment. Sparks fly. Electric feedback sounds make people wince. Gwen stays cool. Scramble's big R bears down on him. He moves sideways to avoid the falling letter. It buries the bass man. 
The A crashes into the audience, directly toward Emma. Waiters, guests, and lawyers jump away. Emma's table disintegrates at impact and sends china and glasses flying. Emma remains stoic and unmoved. She watches stone-faced as Charlie comes down on the drum set like Moon the Loon. A clanging cymbal rolls over the stage and into the audience. Charlie works himself out of the debris and struts towards the microphone. Rock and roll history, ladies and gentlemen. Charlie pushes Gwen away and faces Emma. Now hear this. Now hear this. Death don't us part my ass. I want a divorce. And? I'm going to sue your ass off, you stinky little bitch. I bleed you dry and I hope you'll croak. The hall falls silent, except for a few cheers and some insular clapping. Dina, on the lighting gallery, tries to get a better shot for her video. She accidentally knocks over the cake. It falls. I don't do divorces. The cake impacts on Charlie's head. Interior, house, living room, night. Emma sits in the dark and smokes. The ashtray overflows. Sound of the door, steps. Emma jerks up as if hit by lightning. She listens to Charlie's footsteps. Slowly and deliberately, she squeezes a cigarette into the ashtray. Charlie sneaks through the room without turning on the lights. Emma lights up another cigarette. Charlie stops dead in his tracks. So here we are, finally alone. Charlie steps closer, takes one of her cigarettes, and lights it ostentatiously. He sits down opposite of her. She inhales and blows smoke over to him. He inhales and has to cough until his face turns green. Emma watches with disdain. Fighting for air, Charlie extinguishes his cigarette. Listen very carefully. If you embarrass me again, you wish you were never born. I only wish you were dead. He gets up and hits a light switch. I hate sitting in the dark. He starts for the door. I'm not done with you. He snorts and continues. No one walks out on me. Watch me. One step toward the door. Another step toward the door. Oh gosh, I'm walking out on you. She jumps up and pulls the rug from under his feet. He falls and crashes against a big aquarium. A crack in the aquarium glass slowly spreads until the aquarium bursts. Aquarium water sweeps Charlie off his feet. Fish and sea creatures flip on the floor. Charlie grabs a fish and throws it smack into Emma's face. She slips and falls back on her seat. The chair disintegrates. Charlie gets up and leaves. I'm going to pack my stuff and then I'm out of here. And the first thing I do is find a lawyer to kick your ass. Interior, the house, stairwell night. Charlie hobbles out of the living room. He stops and shakes a big crab out of his pant leg. The crab races away and disappears under a door. Emma flies out of the living room and jumps onto his back. You don't have no stuff. She knocks him over and both fall down the stairs. At the bottom, they both lie motionless. Emma stirs, her eyes open. She studies Charlie, still unconscious. She scrambles up. No one walks out on me. She grabs him and struggles to drag his heavy body away. Exterior, the house, pool, night. Emma drags Charlie to the pool. The heels of his shoes leave drag marks. If I can have you, no one can. Emma puts her whole weight behind a push to dump Charlie into the pool. She slips on a loose tile, falls, hits her head on a light fixture, and splashes into the pool. Slowly. She descends into darkness. Exterior, the house, pool, night. Darkness. Nothing disturbs the immaculate surface of the water. Charlie wakes up. He holds his head disoriented, groans. Slowly, he gets up. Stumbles over to the light switch. He flips a switch. Pool lights illuminate Emma. It takes a while for Charlie to realize Emma floats face down in the pool. Emma? Emma! He jumps into the pool and drags Emma's body out. He starts resuscitation. He pushes down on her heart. He blows air into her mouth. As his lips touch hers, he jerks back. Emma! Oh my God! I killed you! Interior, the house, hall, night. Charlie dials his phone. Hi, Dina? Listen, I have a sort of situation here. No, she didn't kill me. At least, not in a literal sense of the word. 
Charlie stands on a chair. A rope with a noose dangles from a chandelier. But she's out of my life now. Well, she has left me with a parting gift that is rather a dead end. For me, as well as for her. If you get my drift. No? Well, it doesn't matter. If you want your story, you should be here before the TV news crew arrives. Okay, listen, Dina. I just want to let you know that I was thinking of my fans until the end. You might want to write that down so you can quote it. Okay? I gotta run. Before I run out of courage, or resolve, or depression, or however you want to put it. Bye. Charlie hangs up. He tests the rope. The chandelier rips from its socket, crashes down, and shatters. Why does this always happen to me? Interior, the house, door, night. Dina, sound the door. Whatever you're doing, stop! Dina stares at a chair standing next to a smashed chandelier. She starts for the hall. Interior, house, hall, night. Dina enters the hall. Two chairs flank two crashed chandeliers. Dina flies up the stairs. Interior, the house, living room, night. Dina bolts into the room. Charlie sits on a chair next to another smashed chandelier. Do you know how much we've paid to get those chandeliers bolted to the ceiling? This jerk charged extra because he made them earthquake proof. Where's Emma? She's a bit indisposed. Exterior house, pool, night. Dina stares at Emma's body. Did you? I guess. What the fuck do you mean? Did you or didn't you? I don't recall. Are you fucking kidding me? If I killed somebody, that's not something I'd forget. That's definitely something I'd recall. Why does this always happen to me? Hey, listen, for fuck's sake, did you kill your fucking wife or did you not? I don't know. She came after me and then I blanked. Next thing I know, I wake up at the pool and she's floating. Face down. I'm no legal expert, but you're cooked. Help me! I'm not good at fixing things. You have to do something. No, ain't gonna happen. I'm a journalist. I don't do anything. You do, and I watch. And then I sit down and write an article that says that all you ever do is fucking garbage. That's how journalism works. So for once in your story, ask life, be a man, and do it yourself. Listen up, you second-rate inslinger. For the record, I'm a star. And beyond doing it myself, I have people, fans, who only wait for me to do this. He snaps his fingers, beat, nothing happens. Are you gonna kill yourself or what? Charlie thinks hard. No, God no. Why should I kill myself? See, that's what journalists do. They relentlessly dig down to the fucking truth. You married her for the money, didn't you? No, I don't know. The money was nice, but the sex was great. We didn't talk much, but in the bedroom, wow, she was a devil. Okay, that leaves us where? Okay, when I was passed out on the floor, she went away and killed herself. That sounds like a country song. And that's why it's gonna work. It's emotional, it's a story, a tragic story. People love that, especially hard-boiled rednecks like police officers love to pry. I bet you all those tough city cops are listening to country music. Stand by your man. Even if he is a drunken asshole, any sane person wouldn't touch with a ten-foot pole. If she went away and killed herself, how come she's still here? I guess we have to help her a bit with the went away part. With we, you mean you and me. He knows. Was your bath too hot and cooked your fucking pee brain? I don't do illegal. He grabs her. Oh, officer. I was so in love with Dina. I wanted a future. But she... Talking about Emma. She wouldn't let us go. And there we have another country song. One about a crime of passion. A crime of passion we committed together. Because so great was our love. You're a monster. No. On the patron save of Carrie's. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Let's pretend that never happened. I have a better idea. 
You're a writer. You write the suicide note, make it a convincing one. But I suck at writing. And I suck at music. But with her cash, I can hire composers, designers, musicians, producers. <coughs> and the only person with access to me is you. You'll be there every step of the way. You'll be there when I unleash a charm offensive that make frustrated teenies cast Larry looks at older men. I'll make middle-aged housewives pop their cherries because they can't stop daydreaming about the tight fit of my pants. And the velvet timber of my voice will enchant grandma until grandpa digs out his shotgun and chases me through the nursing home. I'm good at one thing and one thing only. I'm good with women. I can make George Clooney look like an amateur. <coughs> you leave me no choice. Of course not. You're in my hand. March or die. The doorbell rings. A fist pounds the door. Police, open up. Exterior, the house, door, night. A patrol car on the driveway. Steve bangs on the door. Police, open up. Exterior, the house, pool, night. Charlie lets go of Dina. Police? Where do they come from? This might have been my fault. I was worried, so I called them. I can't believe it took so long. I really thought for a tiny, tiny moment, fate would give me a break. He meekly starts toward the door. Interior, the house, door, night. Charlie takes a deep breath and opens the door. Steve stares at him for a painfully long time. We received a phone call that there might be an emergency here. I would rather call it a situation. Suspicious, Steve pushes him back and jostles in. Oh, thanks for inviting me in. You want coffee, donut? Steve stares at the broken chandelier. They're earthquake proof. Sir, are you alone? Charlie shrugs, thanks. What was the question? Where is the situation? Like a zombie, Charlie starts for the stairs. Steve follows. He puts his hand on his gun. Exterior, house, pool, night. Charlie and Steve enter the pool area. Emma, in expensive underwear, sits in an armchair. She wears Dina's shades. Her hand seems to be holding a sparkling glass of champagne that really stands on the armrest. Dina, also in underwear, lies on a blanket and drinks from the bottle. <laughs> it's my turn. Now it's my turn. Steve swallows. He doesn't know where to look. He nods a shy greeting to Emma and Dina. Ma'am? Ma'am? Oh, well, I can explain this. Actually, we first called because we thought we needed another participant. In my book, that's clearly an emergency. But then we decided we can work around that problem. And we downgraded it to a situation. Uh, I have to uh, <clears throat> polish my squad car. Steve turns and flees. Charlie ushers him to the door. As soon as they have left, Emma's hand slips. Her glass falls and breaks on the floor. Dina lets herself fall back. She breathes heavily. Sound of the door closing. Charlie returns. He grins at Dina. Now you're officially an accessory to murder. Welcome aboard. Dina throws a bottle at him. He ducks. The bottle hits the wall and bursts into a thousand pieces. All I wanted was exclusive access. How much more exclusive can he get? Exterior. Road above the cliffs. Day. Emma. Dressed. Shades. Propped up behind the wheel of an Alfa Romero spider. Wind plays with her hair. The motor roars. Charlie wedges Emma's leg beneath the dash to make her foot push the pedal. He steps back from the car. The jacked up spider points toward a curve. Behind the curve, a deep drop into the ocean. The spider's back wheels turn. Dina glances at Charlie, who takes aim to kick the jack. Shouldn't you say something? She loved Grace Kelly. He kicks the car jack. Wheels hit the ground. They kick up dust. The spider speeds toward the curve. The spider takes the plunge. Exterior, boat, night. A pleasure craft bobs up and down in the moonlight. A boy seduces a girl. His hand explores the upper regions of her thigh. She is uncomfortable. I don't think it's perfectly OK if we try it once before we get married. You know what? Let's pray about it. He takes her hands into his. He smiles professionally. Dear God, if you think that 
what we're about to do is sin, then please give us a sign. Emma's spider impacts and sinks the boat. <laughs> Boy and girl surface amid debris. She shoots him a bitter look and swims toward shore. In frustration, he gawks at the sky and follows her. Interior of the house, living room night. Charlie comes in, closely followed by Dina. Will they find her? Will she be gone forever? What are we going to do if they find her? What are we going to do if they don't find her? How do we explain her absence? How do we explain anything? I don't know. This is my first time murdering somebody. Well, how do you like it so far? It's a really nice experience. What well, can be more relaxing than to dump a body into the ocean? You should try it sometime. I just did. And for the record, you made me. Because you love me. Don't you remember? Just to be sure, do you expect me to, you know, love you? Well, isn't that the very least I can expect? He sighs and starts to undress. Now? This time is as good as any. Wow, you are romantic. Take your clothes off and let's get cracking. She slips out of her clothes. He hits a switch. Lights dim. A fire crackles in the fireplace. Soft, romantic music emanates from the stereo. They huddle together under a blanket on a polar bear skin in front of the fireplace. Wow, this is the most cliche kind of situation I've ever been in. Do you have to critique everything? I'm a serious journalist. He rolls onto her. I guess I can expect a detailed review. Hold on for a sec. Do you feel anything? Guilt, shame. Will you be taking notes? Do you really want to do this? Nobody cares what I want. I'm just living up to expectations. Listen, Charlie, I'm too old for this. He rolls off her. Oh, thank God. I don't feel like going home. And I don't want to be alone. And they move closer without it being sexual at all. They study each other for a while. I never had a real friend. I don't have any friends either. Exterior ocean night, a dream. Charlie stands on the ocean floor and holds his breath until his lungs explode. He inhales. To his surprise, he can breathe underwater. Nearby, two headlights light up the darkness. A motor roars. Out of the dark, an alpha spider speeds up to Charlie. Emma at the wheel. The spider runs Charlie over. Interior, house, living room, day. Charlie wakes up with a scream and stares into the barrel of Helen's gun. Helen, 30s, straight, tough, jeans and cowboy boots. She wears a police badge. Good morning. Charlie puts his hands up. Helen smiles and holsters her gun. She nods to Steve, who does likewise. Who are you? Well, I'm a huge fan. You can take your hands down. I have all your records. Can I have an autograph? I don't have a pen. He notices his nudity. He pulls the blanket away from Dina to cover himself. Dina grunts, tries to pull the blanket back. To be honest, when I was younger, I used to imagine you like this, but in all that fantasy, I was nude too. And we were alone. Homicide. The door was open. She flashes a badge. Charlie shakes Dina. No, he said we're just friends. He shakes her awake. We have visitors. Armed visitors. They work for the state. Dina jerks up. She huddles with Charlie under the blanket. It's not how it looks like. How does it look like? Is there a reason you're here? Do you know where your wife is? Charlie squints in shock. I don't know. Unfortunately, I do. Would you come with us? Interior, morgue, examination room, day. Helen leads Charlie into a room filled with stainless steel compartments and examining tables. She opens one compartment. On a sliding tray, a body under a sheet. Helen lifts the sheet and reveals Emma's face. Charlie nods. She sank a boat on her way down. She didn't like water sports. She looks so peaceful. Tomorrow we're going to have an autopsy. Of course. Why? Well, just to make sure. That's what we do. We make sure. If there's foul play, I'll figure it out. Good. Did she have a reason to commit suicide? I don't know. How did she feel about the other girl who's just a friend? She is not a friend, but she is a friend. And your wife felt the same way? Basically. Emma always did say Dina writes like a dyslexic primate who flicks poop at people. But besides that, she liked her. Sounds like an interesting relationship. We're not the average couple. You don't say. Helen covers Emma and slides her back. 
Charlie flees from the room. Helen pursues. Interior, more floor, day. Septic floor, flooded by fluorescent light. A water cooler and a coffee vending machine. Dina jumps off her chair. She wipes sweat from her brow. So, you two have been together all night? Dina nods. We're friends, just friends. Would you lie for a friend? Dina stares, thinks hard. Helen's inquisitive gaze almost stuns her. Of course I would. But this time, I don't have to. Charlie searches his pockets for change. Then you've got a watertight alibi. Charlie digs out coins. He drops one. It rolls away. Charlie forcefully steps on it as if it were a nasty insect. Your alibi seems almost too perfect. Charlie feeds quarters into the machine. I have the distinct feeling you're about to accuse me of something. Oh no, not of something. Of murder. Charlie jerks around. Now that she's gone, you're rich. Not just rich, stinking rich. Rich beyond your wildest dreams. I've signed a prenup. I know, it kicks in only in case of a divorce. This is not a divorce. I call that a motive. She pulls a newspaper, a picture. Charlie on the scramble stage full of cake. The headline reads, I don't do divorces. We had some differences every now and then. Dina puts a hand on Charlie's shoulder. Maybe we should leave. I have nothing to hide. I've always been an open book to everyone who cares to read the yellow press. Charlie repeatedly hits the brew button on the coffee machine. It fails to produce a coffee. Okay, let's make this easy. You wanted a divorce. She doesn't do divorces. Because you signed a prenup, you're screwed. Tempers flare, and suddenly, she's dead. You stick her in her car and let her take the plunge into the great beyond. Let's make a deal, and I'll save your life. Charlie shakes the vending machine. A cup pops into place. Can you prove any of this? Give me some time. I'm just getting started. The vending machine makes a crunching noise. Charlie kicks it. Coffee flows into the cup. Charlie takes the cup. It's incredibly hot. Charlie burns his fingers, finds no place to put the cup, and dumps it into the trash. Helen also puts coins in the machine. It hums softly. We've coupled this thing to a polygraph. You failed. The machine is done. Helen grabs a perfectly brewed cup of coffee. She gives Charlie an ironic toast. Exterior, morgue, street, day. Charlie and Dina haste out of the morgue. We made a huge mistake. I know. Let's go to that friendly woman and tell her it's all your fault. Dina turns and heads back in. Charlie zooms after her and pulls her back onto the street. It was an accident. Tempers flared and all your frustration and anger and pain, your low self-esteem and your failure as an artist, and it's found a way to the surface and then... Shut up! I said we've made a mistake. I didn't say let's go and volunteer for capital punishment. Charlie drags her with him down the street. The mistake was that you killed her. She drowned in the pool. But we dumped her in the sea. They're planning an autopsy and she has the wrong water in her lungs. Then we're cooked. Let's go and see that delightful woman. Dina whips around. Charlie pulls her back. This time, I'm not going down without a fight. A cab goes by. Charlie whistles. To his delight, the cab stops immediately. Charlie boards the cab. It drives off. After a few yards, the cab hits the brakes and backs up to Dina. Charlie opens the door and Dina climbs in. Interior, exterior, street, cab, day. The cab zooms through traffic. In the back, Charlie whispers in Dina's ear. Don't worry, I have a plan. All your other plans turned out to be crap. There won't be no autopsy, but as tonight, we're gonna liberate Emma's body. Exterior, morgue, yard, night. A sparsely illuminated yard surrounded by walls, some parked cars and vans, a loading ramp, a janitor throws two bags of trash into a container. When he heads back inside, he leaves the lid open. Movement on top of the wall. Dina clumsily tries to scale the wall. Suddenly, she receives a push, loses her balance, and plunges into the open trash container. Like an angry oyster, the lid snaps shut. The janitor turns around. Nothing. He disappears inside. Charlie glides over the wall like a cat. He stands on the trash container and scans the yard. Dina. Dina pushes the lid open. Charlie loses his balance. He falls onto a stack of old crates. With great noise, the stack collapses. Is that your idea of stealth? Shut up. Charlie scrambles onto his feet. You fucking shut up yourself. On his way toward the building, Charlie steps in an oily puddle. He leaves footprints. Interior morgue, floor, night. The janitor pushes his cart around a corner. 
He wets his string mop to sweep the floor. He notices some footprints. Curiously, he follows oily footprints while he sweeps them up. Interior morgue, examination room night. The footprints lead to the stainless steel compartments. The janitor opens a compartment. Inside, Charlie plays dead. The janitor shrugs, closes a compartment, and leaves grumbling. Dina dashes from behind a curtain and frees Charlie. Clean your fucking shoe! While Dina opens compartments to search for Emma, Charlie finds a towel and wipes his shoe clean. Eventually, Dina finds Emma's compartment. Do I have to touch her? No. Just ask her to get up and walk. They lift her with difficulties. Oh, gosh, she's heavy. Thank God she's dead. Otherwise, she'd kill you for that comment. <laughs> they lift her on a gurney and head for the door. There, Charlie carefully peeks into the corridor. Interior, morgue, floor, night. Charlie and Dina push the gurney down the floor. They stop dead in their tracks. Further down, the janitor has back towards them, cleans an ashtray. Charlie and Dina turn on the spot and push the gurney in the opposite direction. They hasten down the corridor. The janitor finishes with the ashtray. Charlie and Dina pass a building section under renovation. Charlie stops. He frantically nods instructions to Dina to disappear behind the foil-covered scaffolding. Beat. The janitor pushes his cart past their hideout. Charlie and Dina return. They wear painter coveralls and hard hats. Charlie pushes a barrel cart with a big blue plastic barrel. They hasten away from the janitor. The janitor hears something. He stops. Charlie and Dina turn a corner. The janitor turns around and stares down an empty floor. Exterior morgue, back alley, night. The blue plastic barrel drops down from the wall. It hits the street and rolls downhill, picking up speed as it goes. Charlie helps Dina over the wall. Where's Emma? Exterior, lively street, night. The barrel rolls out of the back alley and onto a lively street. It hits a lamppost, changes direction, and rolls down the street. Charlie and Dina emerge from the back alley in hot pursuit of the barrel. The barrel changes lanes and luckily avoids an oncoming car. The barrel heads for a red light and heavy cross traffic. Charlie and Dina run like hell to catch it. When the barrel reaches the intersection, the light changes. Cross traffic stops. The barrel rolls through without problems. The light changes back when Charlie and Dina reach the intersection. They stop, panting heavily. Another great plan that works like a charm. Charlie wants to respond, but has no air left. The light changes. Follow me. Who the fuck are you all of a sudden? Pancho Villa? They continue the pursuit. Exterior dock night. The barrel rolls down the dock. It drops over the edge and falls into the water. It floats. Totally exhausted, Charlie and Dina arrive. They fight for air and watch the barrel bopping in the waves. Eventually, Charlie takes his shoes off and prepares to jump into the water. I get the barrel, you get the car. Interior, the house, basement night. Charlie and Dina carry Emma's body. Charlie opens a deep freezer and they dump her in. Welcome home. On the wall, a photo. Emma in an ice rink, smiling and kissing Rain Gretzky. Tomorrow night we'll bury her, deep in the forest in a very deep hole. He slams the lid shut. Emma, on the photograph, stops smiling. She turns her head and scrutinizes Charlie and Dina. Music. A soft piano version of Charlie's new song startles them. Charlie and Dina follow the sound. Interior, the house, stairwell night. Charlie and Dina climb the stairs, puzzled by the sound. Interior, the house, dining room night. Dim lights. Two chairs at a table set for dinner. Piano keys move all by themselves. Water drops from the keyboard. Charlie and Dina take in the sight, disturbed. Water vapor emerges out of nowhere, condenses, swirls, and slowly transforms into Emma's shape. Eventually, Emma's ghost sits on a chair. She smiles at Charlie. Her whole appearance is slightly transparent. Her pale skin has a bluish tint that seems to glow. Her hair is slightly wet. She leaves traces of moisture wherever she goes. <coughs> you brought me home. You couldn't live without me, couldn't you? The other chair moves, an invitation for Charlie to sit.
Charlie stares, stupefied, not moving an inch. I'm sure the two of you have a lot to talk about. Maybe I should leave. Good idea. The rug under Dina's feet slides away. She falls. The rug rolls around her tight. It rolls out of the room. Interior, the house, stairwell night. The rug rolls down the stairwell. Interior, the house, basement night. The rug ends up beside the deep freezer. Dina tries to escape, but the rug holds her tight. Interior, the house, dining room night. Charlie slowly backs off. Honey, dinner's ready. Two dishes zoom out of the kitchen. One lands in front of Emma. The other hovers before Charlie's nose. Charlie moves slightly to the side. The hovering dish matches his movement. You're here. Of course. Where would I be? I thought you took a little trip. Death don't us part. But that's just a song. No, that's more than a song. It's our destiny. Charlie smacks the plate hovering before him. The contents spray in all directions, zoom through the air until they come together again in a swirling eddy. A gush of water spurts from the eddy and hits Charlie in the face. Honey, you don't think I just roll over and die? Ca Charlie coughs up water. But you did! Emma swooshes out of her seat and transforms into a giant, room-filling, waterlogged corpse. Nightmarish creatures consume her rotten flesh. Water gushes on the floor. Do I look dead to you? Is that a trick question? Emma transforms into a tsunami-like wave that flushes Charlie right through the panorama windows. Exterior, the house, pool, night. Amid glass debris, Charlie plunges into the pool below the dining room. Underwater, he finds himself face to face with Emma's liquid apparition. She smiles sadistically. He swims up, but she pulls him back. She presses her lips on his. Her violent kiss drives all air from his lungs and takes a few years from his life. This marriage is not over yet. Emma dissolves and quickly blends with the water. Charlie struggles to swim upward, but drained of air and power, he slowly sinks to the bottom. The water stirs, forms a vortex, and spits him out. Exterior, the house, sun deck, night. He splashes onto the deck, coughs up water, and stares directly at Emma's shoes. She leers at him, smiling with hungry anticipation. What are you? A ghost? I'm your wife. What do you want? I'm your wife. It's time you treat me as such. Charlie freezes. Oh, no. 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 No, I'm not. Oh, yes, <coughs> you are. Charlie gets up and runs. Emma laughs, laughs, and the swirling sphere of water forms in her hand. She hurls it at Charlie. It splashes down in front of Charlie and turns into ice. Charlie slips, slides, and falls onto a sunbed. The bed catapults him high into the air. A skylight opens, and Charlie falls right into exterior, the house, master bedroom night. Charlie crashes onto the already destroyed bed. Liquid Emma hovers over him. I'm going to rain down on you now. Charlie barely manages to roll off before a gush of water splashes onto the bed. He jumps up and bolts out. Charlie flies, interior of the house, stairwell night. Charlie flies down the stairs. Emma, half liquid, half solid, floats after him. Don't work off all that steam, honey. You'll need that strength. Emma catches Charlie, envelops him, and takes him away. Exterior, the house night. A bone-chilling scream echoes through the night. Beat. The door opens. Charlie staggers out. White skin, gray hair. He has lost a couple of years. He collapses on the lawn. Interior, the house, montage, night. A monsoon-like torrent has devastated the house. Interior, the house, basement, night. The rug slackens and lets Dina go. She dashes out. Exterior, the house, night. Dina emerges from the door. She sees Charlie. She picks him up and they both flee the premises. Exterior, Napoleon's house, yard, day. A rundown house, yard full of junk, chicken house, rabbit cages, a sleeping dog on a chain. 
Dina pushes Charlie through a rusty, creaking gate. Come on, if anyone knows ghost stuff, then it's him. It was he who got me the interview with Michael Jackson. They fired you for that story. Because they're fucking pea brains. After what you've been through the last night, do you have any fucking doubt whatsoever that I've talked to Michael Jackson? An excited chicken flutters through the open window. On it! Charlie grabs the chicken. The chicken glares at Charlie, somewhat disappointed. Napoleon, 50s, small, feisty, bald, fake French accent, wears pajamas under a fading dressing gown, zooms out. He slashes with a big knife and takes the chicken's head right off. I'm sorry, but they can be quick sometimes. Bonjour, Dina. It's simply an unspeakable delight to see you again. He kisses Dina's hand like a European count. Sometimes I think you're the only nice guy in the world. <laughs> what shall I say? It is uh, cutting. Charlie stares at the chicken's headless, blood sprouting body in his hand. He holds on to Dina to avoid fainting. Is this a ritual? No, it's supper. Louisiana fried chicken, a succulent golden brown eruption of pure taste with coleslaw. Who is asking? I'm a guy with a ghost problem. He hands Napoleon the dead chicken. Interior, Napoleon's house, kitchen, day. Small, dark kitchen, crammed full with an eclectic collection of voodoo implements. Charlie and Dina watch Napoleon eat Louisiana fried chicken with coleslaw. A ghost is an ephemeral soul that is carved in the in-between. It is held back by unfinished earthly business. I am assuming that unfinished business is you. So what do I do? Give her what she wants. I think she wants me. In that case, for lack of a better word, you're cooked. Like Louise here. Peace be upon your simple chicken soul. He offers Charlie a drumstick. She would like to shake your hand. No, thank you. But peace be with her. Can't you show me how to... Do an enchantment, a spell, an invocation? My friend, if it were just a spell or an incantation, everybody would do it, eh? No, she has refused to cross the river into the great beyond. Why don't you give her what she wants? Untie her soul before she forever remains trapped in the dire madness of the netherworld, eh? But she wants to suck my life out of my bones. You could send her a guiding spirit. How do I do that? Easy. A human sacrifice, eh? A winning victim will give us his or her life for you. Her spirit can guide the ghost to the river and onto the ferry. Charlie and Napoleon look at Dina. You're fucking chauvinists, both of you. You hear sacrifice and the first thing you do is look for a woman? You want to guide her over? Go kill yourself. By the way, he will inherit fortune. And I'm talking real fucking wealth. He's loaded with money. Napoleon's face lights up. I might be able to employ my art for your benefit. But be warned, it is dark, dangerous, and it won't be cheap. It doesn't have to be. Exterior, the house, driveway, Honda, day. Dina's Honda zooms up the driveway. Charlie and Dina jump out. They nervously usher Napoleon to the door. Don't worry, I've crossed blades with the minions of the underworld many times. If you're kidding me, she's going to eat you. And she won't take the time to fry you golden brown like Louisa the simple chicken soul. My friend, I said some reservation. But be assured, I am always victorious. I wipe them out, I obliterate them. I clean this world from the scourge of the dead. Oh gosh, I hope so. But if you end up dead, don't come to me and cry. Give the man a chance. Michael Jackson assured me he knows what he's doing. Interior, the house, stairwell day. On the wall, a photo of Emma shaking hands with the Pope. Emma breaks eye contact with the Pope and watches Napoleon climb the stairs. She winks to the Pope, who stops smiling. Interior of the house, living room night. Charlie leads Napoleon into the room. Emma lies decoratively on the sofa like a silent movie star, expecting the devotion of her fans. Dina hides behind Napoleon, who studies Emma's wicked smile. You sure that is indeed an apparition, not a neighbor, a mistress, the cleaning lady? No. Nope. That's the ghost of my dead wife. Death don't us part. Well, who am I to criticize the use of your considerable financial potential? Napoleon opens his case and produces a bottle of vodka and a candle. He lights the candle and drinks a huge gulp. With the candle, like a circus fire breather, he ignites a fine mist of vodka he spits in Emma's direction. 
When the flame kisses Emma's nose, she shrieks in sheer panic. A blue swoosh rockets away, leaving a trail of sizzling steam. Napoleon snorts in stunned surprise. He chokes on the rest of his vodka. Blowback from the fire hits him in the face, singes his eyebrows, and sets his hair on fire. He slaps the flames and coughs his heart out. Stanley douses Napoleon's burning hair with water from a flower vase. Shit, oh my god, man! That was a real fucking ghost! Did you see that? A ghost? A real fucking ghost! Napoleon slaps out the last embers of his burning hair. Why is he so surprised? Why are you so surprised? My books, all I read, it's all true. The river, the fairy, the light, I read all those books and it's all true. Napoleon thinks, smiles, chuckles, laughs at them. <laughs> He's no ghostbuster. He's a fraud. Who cares? She's gone. Emma swoops back with a mind-numbing roar. She reshapes into a giant, swollen, waterlogged corpse, populated by nightmarish creatures. Her mouth opens wide. She reveals blood-dripping fangs about to devour Napoleon. Napoleon's eyes telescope out. His laugh freezes. He falls and hits the floor like a dead old tree. Emma takes on her old form. This is by far the worst ghostbuster I've ever worked with. Slowly, a pale, bluish version of Napoleon emanates from his lifeless body and floats to the ceiling. Welcome to the afterlife. It's all true. Well, where's the fairy? I don't know and I don't care. I'm staying here with my husband. Napoleon floats away. Interior of the house, living room day. Emma and Napoleon's ghost are gone. Charlie and Dina watch two paramedics rip Napoleon's shirt open. They apply the pedals of a defibrillator. Dina rams her elbow into Charlie's side and points to the window. Outside, Napoleon floats in midair. He stares at his hand and nods. His hand follows the command, transforms into a giant, bloodthirsty zombie head, and sinks his teeth into Napoleon's throat. Now we have two to deal with. How should I fucking know that he's a fucking fraud? That he arranged an interview with dead Michael Jackson? That might have been a clue. Clear! The paramedic fires a defibrillator. A tidal wave-like force draws Napoleon through the window back into the room. Again, clear. He fires again. A second tidal wave sucks Napoleon's ghost back in his body. He opens his eyes, takes a loud and shrieking breath. Welcome back. What the fuck was that? The paramedics lift Napoleon on a stretcher. Like he only had a fucking tourist visa to the great beyond. Is that normal? I mean, have you ever seen a dead person? His gesture creates a floating ghost. Oh, a lot of people see the ghosts of their loved ones. They're all nuts. The paramedics leave. Interior, the house, stairwell day. The paramedics carry Napoleon down. Charlie and Dina follow. Interior, the house, day, door. The paramedics load Napoleon into a waiting ambulance. As soon as Dina is through the door, it slams shut and traps Charlie inside. Outside, Dina whips around, eyes wide in horror. Inside, panic. Charlie tries to force open the door, but it remains hermetically sealed. Music from upstairs. Charlie takes a deep breath and turns to face the music. Interior, the house, living room day. Charlie enters carefully. Emma lies on the grand piano. She watches water drip from her hair onto the keys that move by themselves. The piano plays Charlie's new song. Charlie, I'm sorry. Their eyes meet. Charlie stops dead. I know I've been a bitch. In my defense, you're not an easy husband, but I think I might have gone too far. Sorry. Her eyes follow water dripping from the keys onto the floor. Charlie moves as if navigating a minefield. You know, this is really good. Charlie, he stops dead. The world needs to hear this. I did not know that there was so much depth in you. How do you want to call it? True love. That's nice, true love. Do you have someone specific in mind? He nods. Her smile lingers halfway between smitten and murderous. You're a hopeless romantic. Now I'm really sorry that I was such a bitch. That's okay. 
No, it isn't. Charlie. Yes? I promise you, the world will hear this. And they won't just hear it, they will love it. This will become a soundtrack for a whole generation. Roscoe doesn't like it. Roscoe likes what I tell him to like. So you'll put in a good word for me? Oh, I'm going to do much more than that. You want to be a star? I will make you a star. You? Oh, my little innocent Charlie. Look at me. Look what I have become. I'm an immortal soul. I am your destiny. And what do you get? I am your wife. I've sworn to love you, hold you, and cherish you till death don't us part. What if I don't want? Then all you get is an eternity of doubt and remorse, wondering what you could have been if you had found the courage to say yes to me. You'll see those golden stars of heaven dancing in the sublime light, and in sleepless nights you whisper to yourself, that could have been me. She opens her arms, and her eyes invite him into her embrace. He draws closer, but... I'm going to lose half a lifetime in your embrace. Charlie. Death makes time meaningless. I'm afraid. She lowers her arms. Give me a second. A steamy tidal wave of Emma zooms into the chimney. Exterior, the house, day. Emma zooms out of the chimney high into the sky. Interior, Roscoe's office, toilet, day. Roscoe sits on the toilet and reads a whitewater kayaking magazine. A water jet erupts geyser light from beneath him and washes him against the ceiling. Swirling eddies of white water throw him from one wall to the other. Suddenly, the flood stops mid-wave, and part of a towering and quivering tsunami manifests itself in Emma's shape. Call Charlie and tell him you've changed your mind. He's <coughs> come back, is back on, and <coughs> make it happen. Interior, Roscoe's office, day. The toilet door bursts open. A tidal wave washes Roscoe into the room. Fingers of angry water grab the phone and smash it in his face. Interior of the house, living room day. The phone rings. Charlie answers. He listens. Roscoe's agitated voice on the other side swamps him with excited lines. Calm down, Roscoe. Emma, half liquid sunshine and half lingerie clad van, hovers lasciviously at the door. Roscoe, shut up. I'm in the middle of something. I'll need to call you back. He hangs up. Come, I can give you pleasures you cannot even imagine. Behind Charlie's squinted eyes wages a war. Sanity loses as he slowly approaches Emma and follows her out of the room. Interior of the house, master bathroom, day. Emma floats onto the bed. She smiles at Charlie like a hungry fly trap. Charlie takes a deep breath. He prepares to let himself fall into the swirling cloud of Emma's embrace when someone bangs on the door. Open up! Police! We have a warrant! Crash! <coughs> the police breaches the door. Heavy steps of multiple combat boots charge up the stairs. Excuse me for a moment. I've got to kill someone. No! Stop! Let me take care of them. If you want to help, go and hide your body. Emma thinks. And as soon as they're gone, we can pick up where we left off. Honey, why can't I simply kill them? Sweetie, my comeback shouldn't be associated with a mass slaughter of police officers. That would create a bit of PR problem for my nice guy image. Okay, for you. Don't be too long. Emma evaporates. As a cold mist, she hits the faces of Helen, Steve, and several police officers as they storm the room. They all cringe. What the heck was that? The air conditioning is a bit temperamental. Interior, the house, montage day. Officers search the house. They cut open pillows, empty drawers, check for secret compartments in walls and floors, but they find nothing. Interior, the house, basement, day. Steve opens the freezer. Emma's body is gone. Interior, crypt of Emma's dad, day. Dusty crypt, full of cobwebs. The wall displays a relief bust of Emma's dad. Emma's ghost sits on the steps of a large stone sarcophagus. She cradles her dead body like a sleeping baby. She pets her body's hair and softly hums a nursing tune. Interior, the house, living room day. Charlie watches Helen take books from a shelf, leaf through them and throw them on the floor. Charlie, where is your wife? Isn't she supposed to be in the morgue? I know where she's supposed to be. 
Question is, where is she? You lost her? Oh no, I think someone took her. If you lost her, I'm gonna have my lawyers have a field day with your career. And when I'm done, you're lucky if they let you guard a parking lot. Come on, you know better than to threaten me. I can see right through you. And your razor-sharp policewoman wit figure that I had hit her body in a book? Maybe she pulled a Jesus and came back from the grave. You know, that's an interesting proposition. Do you believe in ghosts? I believe in justice. Justice has a crude sense of humor. Steve enters. He shakes his head. Nothing. To be honest, I'm somewhat relieved. Because you're a fan? Sounds funny, doesn't it? Maybe I dug a deep hole in the forest. If you did, you didn't take your car. We checked your tires for clues. Checked your shoes, too. You made me doubt my guilt. Is that a confession? No, that's sarcasm. It'll be a sad day when the idol of my adolescence gets the needle. But I will make sure that you... A big book falls off the shelf and hits Helen on the head. Ouch! Charlie jumps up, looks around. He finds Emma on a photo reading the same book that fell on Helen's head. As he takes in the picture, Emma looks back at him. She lays her angry eyes on Helen. This was fun, but now it's time to go. He ushers Helen and Steve out. I'm going to bust your ass. If I ever wanted to get my ass busted, believe me, it's you I want my ass to be busted by. Emma's photo falls off the wall. But for now, you must bust my ass from the outside. Interior, the house, door, day. Charlie ushers the police officers out, thinks a moment, and follows them. Exterior, the house, driveway, day. Charlie slams the door shut. He grabs Helen's arm and heads for her unmarked truck. Is that your ride? Come on, I buy you lunch. Helen looks at him, confused. If you want to bust my ass, you might as well get to know me better. It can only help. Maybe you'll find an angle to exploit. Maybe if I'm drunk, I might make a confession. He gets into Helen's truck. Steve holds Helen back. Do you think that's what? Don't worry, I've got a gun. Please do worry, because I've got rhythm. Steve shrugs. She takes the wheel and drives off quickly. Interior, truck stop restaurant, day. A greasy country bar. A lonesome waitress fills ketchup bottles. A short order cook reads a paper. Open kitchen, no guests. Photos of country music stars cover the walls. Long wooden tables and benches orient toward a large bandstand. Last night's set still stands on the stage. Charlie and Helen enter. Is this your regular hangout? No, I haven't been here in years. Here's where the magic began on open mic Tuesday. What? The velvet timber that is a little bit like slowly aged whiskey saw the light of day here? Hey, you've read Rolling Stone? I'm sure they'll be happy to print your obituary, too. After his career tanked, he cracked and killed his wife. How about an obsessive police officer admitted to that house? If I were slowly aged whiskey, I would sue them for that comparison. No, you wouldn't. You like my timber as much as you like slowly aged whiskey. They sit down at a table. The waitress approaches. Two lunch specials. Lots of hot sauce. The waitress leaves. She lifts two fingers. The cook nods and throws burgers on the grill and fries it in deep, fat fryer. Did you love your wife? Charlie points to a photo. It shows Emma on the truck stop stage kissing Billy Ray Cyrus. The women I take here I usually marry. Holding in mind what happens to the women you marry that could be seen as a threat. Emma didn't believe in divorce. Is that a confession? No, that's public knowledge. Emma, on the photo, stops kissing Billy Ray and looks at Charlie and Helen, her eyes narrow. I play a 59 Strat. A rock and roll machine. Sweet. One day, I took my guitar here. Open mic Tuesday. I made them scream. And what did they scream? Take your shirt off. <laughs> and did you? I flashed my badge instead. And so ended what could have been a wonderful career in showbiz. What's so wonderful about being in showbiz? What do you mean? Are you crazy? Everybody wants to be in showbiz. Everybody wants to sell out to some drunken jerks. If the price is right. So what's your price? I have no price. You're that cheap? No, I'm star. Stars come and they fade away. I guess you think if some jerk is putting his hands together, that's love. But it isn't. It's just noise. And when the noise stops, the stars fall. And the noise always stops. It has stopped for you, hasn't it? Hey, buddy, I've got some news. You're screwed. You sold your soul to fleeting fame. What are you going to sell now? You've got me all figured out. Pretty much.
Where were you last night? Can't remember. Why don't you ask Dina? That's the naked lady that was with me on the polar bear rug in front of the fireplace. You might have noticed her in the corner of your eye when you stared at my butt. Don't worry, I'm not distracted by a firm butt. I bet you ten bucks that I can crack your alibi within a day or two. She's not as slick as you are. She's your Achilles heel. Want to play me a swan song? He nods toward the stage. Sure. We can call it Goodbye Charlie Blues. Helen strides to the stage. She takes a guitar, plugs it in and flips the switch. She produces a few shy notes. She kicks in overdrive and rocks away with a mean rhythm that would make Eric Clapton proud. Charlie claps in complete surprise. On the photo, Emma's eyes narrow as she watches Helen play. Charlie hurries to the stage. He sits down behind the drum set and lays down a beat. Charlie and Helen rock together. They play a rock and roll version of Death Don't Us Part. The cook and the waitress smile fascinated by the music. On the photo, Emma's face darkens. She pushes back Billy Ray Cyrus and disappears from the photo. The cap of the ketchup bottle unscrews and falls on the table. It rolls a bit, twirls, and comes to a rest. A drop of ketchup emerges from the bottle with a soft pop. It hovers. Other bottles on other tables unscrew and pop open. Everywhere, tiny red drops emerge from ketchup bottles and slowly fill the room with hovering red drops. Charlie undresses Helen with his eyes. When he spots the drops, he stops playing. She's here. Who's here? Emma. One tiny red drop zooms forward and hits Helen smack on her forehead. Confused, she wipes her brow. Ketchup drops attack like a swarm of angry hornets. The drops rain down on Helen like the bullets of a machine gun. Charlie protects Helen with his own body. The drops retreat for a moment. They circle Charlie and Helen. The drops run amok. They smash the windows and instruments, shoot the pictures from the wall, and kill all the bottles in the extensive bar. One bottle flies and splashes in the fryer. Fat flies, hits the grill, and ignites. The resulting exploding flame sets the kitchen on fire. All the ketchup balls fall out of the air, and a bluish Emma swoosh retreats with a gut-wrenching shriek. Helen rips a fire extinguisher from a wall mount and fights the flames. Exterior, truck stop restaurant, parking lot, truck, day. Smoke, fire trucks, lights flash, firefighters clear up. Helen shakes the fire captain's hand and joins Charlie, who leans against her truck, biting his nails. Have you got anything to say? I'm sure you'll figure it out eventually. Shall I put to my report that we were attacked by rogue ketchup? That sounds silly. When you said Emma was here, were you talking about a ghost? That's a good explanation as being attacked by a rogue ketchup. Liquid creeps slowly out of a nearby sewer and slithers toward the truck. Helen gets into her car. She slaps the wheel. I don't know what you're pulling here, but I'm not as gullible as you obviously think I am. I don't believe in ghosts. Charlie notices the liquid creep into the engine compartment. Get out! But the door slams shut and traps Helen. Charlie wants to rip it open, but the door locks. The window rolls up. The motor starts, roars, the truck takes off. Charlie holds onto a rack and scrambles onto the bed. Helen steps on the brakes, but it has no effect. Interior, exterior, street, truck, day. The truck zooms through traffic. Charlie has difficulties hanging onto the rack. Interior, exterior, dock, truck, day. The truck veers off the road, breaks through a fence, and barrels down the dock. Charlie hangs on for dear life. Helen tries to steer, but the truck does not react. The truck soars over the edge and splashes into the water. Slowly, the truck sinks. Exterior, underwater, truck, day. Helen tries to open the door, but it stays locked. Water filters into the cabin. Charlie tries to rip open the door, but it does not budge. The truck disappears beneath the surface. Charlie holds onto the door. The truck drags him down. He locks eyes with Helen. She slaps the window in panic. Charlie nods and both try to kick in the glass, but the window holds. A vortex forms above Charlie. The swirl grabs his legs and carries him away from the truck. Emma's liquid face smiles at Helen. She jerks back in shock. Exterior dock day. 
Charlie launches out of the water like a missile fired from a submarine. He crashes into a stack of boxes on the dock. Charlie ignores the pain and crawls out of the debris. He spots a crowbar, grabs it, and jumps back into the water. The water turns into ice. He lands hard, hurts his foot, screams, lets go of the crowbar. The crowbar slides over the ice. Emma's transparent head emerges from the ice. Let her go. No. Charlie grabs a crowbar and hits Emma's head. The ice shatters into a million tiny crystals. Charlie plunges into the water and dives down. Interior, exterior, underwater, truck, day. Water floods a cabin. Helen draws a last breath from a tiny air pocket. All the air is gone. Bubbles emerged from Helen's mouth. She drowns. Charlie smashes the windshield with his crowbar. He grabs Helen and drags her out. Helen makes a few weak moves to help. Too late, she faints. More bubbles emerge from her mouth. Charlie drags Helen upward. Suddenly, Helen's body stops moving. Emma holds onto Helen's foot and pulls her down. Charlie clings to Helen as Emma drags her into the deep. Bubbles emerge from his mouth. He grabs Helen even tighter. Darkness slowly encloses Charlie. As reality fades away, Charlie smirks at Emma's hateful glare. Two arms grab Charlie and pull him up. He still clings to Helen. Exterior, fishing boat, day. Two fishermen hoist both of them out of the water into their boat. They have some difficulty to free Helen from Charlie's embrace. They resuscitate the lifeless bodies. Interior, hospital corridor, night. Charlie heads over to a patient room. He slurps hot tea. Officer Steve leaves the room as Charlie enters. How is she? Thanks to you, she'll be okay. But we'll bust your ass nevertheless. Sorry, but you have to take a number. Charlie pushes past him. Interior, hospital, nurse station, night. A nurse sits down with a cup of coffee. She opens a paper and reads a notice about Emma's death. And this headshot winks at the nurse. The nurse startles. A blue swoosh hits the nurse and merges with her. She puts down coffee and paper and leaves. Her eyes are completely blue. Interior hospital room night. Dim light, monitors beep and flicker and machines hum. Helen lies in a bed. She wears an oxygen mask. An IV drops liquid into her veins. Charlie pulls a chair. Helen opens her eyes. She looks at him. Helen tries to take off the oxygen mask. No need to say anything. You know, hang on to you was the first selfless thing I ever did. Let's not spoil my illusion of being a hero by discussing it. And I know that you'll bust my ass nevertheless. The nurse enters the room. She prepares medication. Charlie notices her ghostly blue eyes. Shit. The nurse raises her arm to stab Helen with a long needle. Charlie grabs a spare blanket and deflects her thrust. The nurse raises her arm to stab again. Charlie pulls Helen off the bed. She drops hard moans. Charlie rams the bed against the nurse. Her arms flail. The needle slashes across Charlie's chin. Blood drips. Shocked, he retreats. The nurse goes for Charlie's throat. She attacks. They stumble and fall. She tries to push her needle in his throat. Charlie counters as hard as he can, but the needle slowly reaches his skin, penetrates, and draws a drop of blood. A sudden force jerks back the nurse. Helen strangles the nurse with her IV and oxygen hoses. Under her iron grip, the nurse lets go of the needle. Helen grabs a bottle and knocks the nurse out cold. A bluish vapor leaves the nurse and disappears into the ventilation. Helen helps Charlie get up. She looks at his wound. It's only superficial. Death does not seem as final as I thought it was. As hard as it is to believe, I think I've seen my first ghost. Maybe I should call those nice guys with the straitjacket. Is she pissed because you killed her? I don't know. She ruined my life and now she's come back to ruin it some more. The jury will love you because they'll be home early. <laughs> Exterior, Napoleon's house, yard day. A scream emerges from the house as Charlie turns a corner. He startles, but he sprints to the door and kicks it down. Interior, Napoleon's house, living room day. Charlie bursts into the room. Don't take him! Take me! He stops dead and appears somewhat dumbfounded at Napoleon and Dina making out on the dinner table. Sorry, 
Didn't you say he and you were not, uh, you know, were romantically involved? We agreed that we were just friends. I didn't know that he had those feelings. I don't have those feelings. I heard the noise and thought Emma was torturing him. That's a fucking insult. Uh, but he came to save me. That's nothing but bold, gallant, and, and very chivalrous. Oh, chivalrous, my ass. Guys always stick together. That's so typical. You two should get a room and do it yourselves. Dina pushes Napoleon away, collects her clothes from various places, and gets dressed. Napoleon does likewise. He pulls up his pants. My friend, I have been contemplating your dilemma. Zip your fly. You really are a piece of work. My friend, I took some creative license, I know. But nevertheless, I am the closest thing to an expert that you have. Do you have the audacity to call yourself an expert? Not only have I the largest collection of literature concerning ghosts, the undead, and the creatures of doom north of Baton Rouge, but on top of that, I was dead myself, a ghost, an ephemeral being that roamed the twilight zone between the hither and the great beyond, and I am here to tell you the tale. How much more expert can you get? Okay, you're the well of wisdom. What now? What we have to do is to disattach her from the corporal reality of this world. To achieve this, we should terminate the physical existence of her corpse, and then we destroy everything she owns, likes, and clings to. That's easy. Kill Charlie and you're done. If he would die and guide her over, that would be the easiest. Let's call that plan B. Exterior, the house, door, day. Charlie, Dina, and Napoleon get out of Napoleon's car. A 1950s Chevy hearse. Okay, let's find ourselves a body. You sound like a randy necrophiliac. Charlie tries the door. It creaks as it opens. Dead silence. But as soon as they cross the threshold, soft piano music filters from upstairs. Interior, the house, living room day. Emma sits on the couch and puts lipstick on her decaying body. Charlie, Dina, and Napoleon slowly enter. I'll distract her. You'll take the body. I'll meet you at the crematorium. Famous last words. Hi, honey. What's for dinner? Emma whips around and drills her eyes into Charlie's head. However, Charlie stands his ground. How was your day? Did anything interesting happen while I was away? I was betrayed by my husband. That bitch. He was with another woman. That's exactly why your daddy made him sign a prenup. Emma flies right in his face. I tried to kill her, but he saved her. Charlie gestures to Dina and Napoleon to sit down next to Emma's body. Reluctantly, they comply. And you tried to kill me too? Just a little bit. Only so that we could be dead together. Honey, we'll never be dead together. If I die, I go right for the light and onto the ferry. I'm not going to stay here. I'm no ghost material. When I'm dead, I'm done. Why are you so narrow-minded? Couldn't you see the power we both could have? Who needs other people when we can have us? When we can have this? She whips around, reshapes into a nine-headed creature who startles Dina and Napoleon with razor-sharp fangs. If I want to scare people, I'll send a lawyer. Emma retakes her old form. She reaches for his hand. He draws it back, but she seizes it. You are all about love, aren't you? You're cold. She gets closer to him. Just because I'm a little bit dead? Kiss me! He hesitates. Eventually, he purses his lips and softly kisses her. He nods to Dina and Napoleon. Emma explodes and grabs him in violent embrace. She kisses him passionately. They spin in midair like a washing machine. They tumble, turn, and vibrate. Parts of her body merge with his. Dina and Napoleon grab Emma's body and rush it outside. When Charlie and Emma eventually separate, she zooms high into the air. She looks jubilant, more healthy, more opaque, more colorful, and less bluish. Charlie hits the ground and has aged 10 years. His skin has picked up a bluish tint. She comes down to him. How was it for you? Interior, exterior, the house, driveway, Chevy hearse day. Dina and Napoleon throw Emma's body into the Chevy hearse and take off with screeching tires. What about Charlie? Let's contemplate that question from a greater distance. The hearse speeds away into the sunset. Interior house, living room night. The stereo blasts a classical piece. Emma, in a vaporous, cloud-like state, hovers under the ceiling and dances, a quivering, oscillating dance. Charlie lies on the floor and watches her. 
He crawls slowly to the door and pulls himself up on the door frame. Emma doesn't notice his escape. Interior, the house stairwell night. Charlie stumbles down the stairs. Exterior, the house driveway, BMW night. Charlie lurches forward, falls, picks himself up, continues and gets into his BMW. The BMW zooms away. Exterior, crematorium, Chevy Hearst night. An employee flips the we're open sign. It now reads, closed. He locks the door and strolls to his car. Dina and Napoleon watch him drive away from inside the hearse. As soon as he is gone, they unload a gurney with Emma in body bag. They push her to the entrance. Napoleon opens the door like a seasoned thief. Looks like you've done that before. I'd say uh, ghost busting is a second career. They disappear into the building. Interior, the house living her night. Emma quivers, still caught up in her dance. Suddenly she stops. She looks around. No Charlie. Interior, the house, montage night. Emma zooms through the house. No Charlie anywhere. In a bolt of purple anger, Emma takes off like a missile and shoots straight through the ceiling. Exterior, the house night. Emma rockets through the roof and arcs high into the sky. Exterior, crematorium, BMW night. Charlie's BMW slides to a halt next to Napoleon's hearse. He leaps out and rushes to the entrance. Interior, crematorium, furnace, night. This room is not open to the public. It is highly technical, efficient, with an industrial feel. A human-sized cardboard coffin sits on a rack in front of an open furnace door. Dina impatiently glances at her watch. Push the fucking button. Napoleon stares at the control board and compares the layout with an instruction sheet. He pushes buttons and pulls levers. Nothing happens. I was a humanities major. Charlie stumbles in. How's it going? Dina startles, whips around. She stares at an aged Charlie. Oh, God, what did she do to you? What she always does. Just love me. Charlie snatches the instruction sheet, turns it 180 degrees, reads, and finds a button labeled Start. A push and the furnace wakes to life. That little button would have been my next choice. Exterior, crematorium night. Emma swooshes through the night sky above the crematorium. With an immense shriek, she drives, dives down into a ventilation shaft. Interior, crematorium, furnace night. Charlie and his friends whip around in fear as Emma zooms out of a ventilation grill and hits the coffin. The body inside begins to stir. Push her in! Before they can push Emma into the flames, her body kicks open the cardboard coffin and rolls off the rack. She picks herself up like a clumsy zombie. Charlie, Dina, and Napoleon each retreat into a different corner. Their eyes are wide with fear. Leave them be and take me. To his surprise, Emma does not attack. Shrieking like an owl in distress, Emma quickly staggers away with all the grace of a short-circuited robot. Charlie and his friends gawk. Napoleon slaps his forehead. That's it! Eureka! She is afraid of fire. That is her Achilles heel. She fears the flames of damnation, the blazing breath of hell. Water and fire do not fucking mix! Let's get her. They run after Emma. Exterior, crematorium night. Emma pushes through the door. Charlie and Napoleon grab her and pull her back. Emma clutches the door handles. Even with Dina helping, they have trouble pulling her inside. Interior, crematorium, furnace, night. Charlie and his friends drag a heavily resisting Emma back to the furnace. Suddenly, her body goes slack, and Emma's ghost materializes as a nightmarish hellhound. The hellhound attacks and drives Charlie, Napoleon, and Dina away. Emma zooms back in her body and runs for it. Charlie and his friends pick themselves up and pursue. Interior, crematorium, corridor, night. Emma hurries down the corridor like a fearful monster. Charlie, Dina, and Napoleon burst through a door and cut her off. Emma stops, scans for a way out. She locks herself in a ladies' room. Charlie rips a fire axe from a wall mount. Interior, crematorium, ladies' room, night. Emma leaves her body and zooms through the ventilation, sound of the axe hacking down the door. Exterior, crematorium, night. Emma zooms high into the air. 
Exterior, hospital entrance, van, night. Steve helps Helen into a waiting police van. Emma hits the van like a blue arrow. Doors lock and the van takes off like a fighter jet. Exterior, streets, van, montage, night. The van crashes through the city traffic like an out of control steamroller, leaving a path of destruction in its wake. Interior, crematorium, corridor, night. Charlie hacks the door to shreds. Dina and Napoleon grab Emma's slack body. Exterior, crematorium night. The van barrels past Hearst and BMW and heads straight for the crematorium wall. The van smashes through the brickwork like a wrecking ball. Interior, crematorium, furnace night. Just as Charlie and his friends throw Emma back into the cardboard coffin, the police van comes crashing through the back wall. Charlie, Dina, and Napoleon whip around in shock. They watch a blue mist emerge from the van and swoop back into Emma's body. Helen and Steve emerge from the van, still stunned from the ride. Clumsy zombie Emma climbs out of the coffin. Her lips do not move as her voice thunders through the room. My husband has killed me! Emma's corpse points a bony finger at Charlie. Murderer! 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 Emma's corpse stalks toward Charlie. He retreats until his back hits the wall. In utter desperation, he hacks the fire axe into Emma's head. There, it gets stuck. Emma stops moving and stares with dead eyes at Charlie. Helen comes closer. Charlie shrugs in desperation. Yes, I killed her. I killed her with my bare hands, and I don't regret it. If I could do it again, I would. No, I don't think you did it. What? Why not? The corpse collapses. Blue vapor leaves it and collapses into Emma's shape. Emma and Helen muster each other with utmost hostility. Yes, why not? If this were true, you wouldn't need this bombastic spectacle. You'd let the evidence simply speak for itself. But it's silent. Anger makes Emma oscillate and change color. This marriage is not over. I believe it is. Death does you part. Emma turns into blue vapor. She furiously rockets through the room. Light fixtures explode and spray glass in all directions. She is afraid of fire. Helen grabs a string moth that leans against a wall. She sets it on fire in the furnace. With the burning string moth, she corners Emma's ghost. He didn't kill you. Now get lost and don't come back. Emma zooms through a window. It shatters into a million pieces. I can't remember a thing. I just assume I did it because... Because she told you. Well, she lied. But you stole the body. Yes. You have to come with us until we've sorted this out. Interior morgue, forensic lab, day. The medical examiner pushes his glasses up and signs a report. He hands his report to Helen. In the background, Emma on an examining table. Two assistants try to get the axe out of Emma's head, but no matter how hard they push or pull, it doesn't move. She spent some time in a deep freezer just before she down in the pool. Not in seawater, she had a fracture on her right side. Either she fell or she was whacked by a left-handed person. The axe is post-mortem. Charlie is not left-handed. Maybe he is smart and whacked her all with his left hand. Thanks. And you really saw her ghost? Helen musters him in cold silence. I'm no shrink, but in times of extreme stress, there can be hallucinations. I'll keep that in mind. Interior, the house, pool, day. Helen circles the pool. She carries a burning torch. From a photo on the wall, Emma's eyes follow her. Helen discovers drag marks from Charlie's shoes. She forms a mental image and reenacts the crime. She pulls an imaginary body along the drag marks. She thinks, looks at the pool. She tries to push an imaginary body into the pool. She slips on the broken tile. She falls and almost hits her head on the same light fixture that knocked out Emma. Helen takes out a black light. It reveals blood stains on the light fixture. Gotcha. Interior of the house, living room day. Emma picks up a framed photo of Charlie, blows a kiss at it, and casually tosses it through the broken window. Exterior of the house, pool day. The framed photo hits Helen and knocks her out. She falls into the pool. Exterior, police station day. The sun sets over a police station. Officers and police cars come and go. Interior, police station. Holding cell, night. 
Charlie sits at his small table and munches a stale sandwich. Behind Charlie's back, a toilet. The water in the toilet produces a small bubble. The bubble slowly floats up to the ceiling where it pops. The drop falls on Charlie's brow. He looks up. Drops have collected all over the ceiling. Now they all fall down at once and gather into Emma's shape. Creeping out of the sewer? <laughs> That's so you. You know that little bitch of yours? She's gone. She's dead? No, I want you dead and not her. Charlie drops the sandwich and carefully wipes his hand. Okay, let's make a deal. What do you have in mind? Let her go, get me out, and I kill myself. You can kill yourself right here. If I kill myself, I do it alone. I do it where and how I choose. I've had people watching me all my life. I'm done with that. If you take the ferry and leave me alone, she's going to pay the price. Don't worry. I'm coming for you. Emma transforms into a tornado-like swirl and punches a big hole into the back of Charlie's cell. Charlie escapes. Interior, Dina's apartment house. Apartment door, Dane. Charlie bangs on Dina's door and rings the bell. Dina opens. Fuck, please don't tell me you ran. Of course not. I stole a cart. Are you crazy? You're fucking killing me. Oh no, you're killing me. We're going with plan B, human sacrifice. You know, I actually wanted to cut back on human sacrifices. Not tonight. He pushes past her. Napoleon, put your pants on. I need your help. Exterior, hospital, ER entrance, Dina's Honda, night. An ambulance zooms up the ramp. Paramedics jump out and rush patients into the ER. They leave the ambulance doors open. Napoleon emerges from behind a pillar and steals a defibrillator. As he casually strolls away, Dina's small Honda stops next to him. Napoleon gets in the back. The car merges with traffic. Inside the Honda, Charlie and Dina exchange a look. To the fish market. Dina pushes the pedal. Exterior fish market, rear side night. Charlie and Dina watch Napoleon work a window open. Interior fish market corridor night. The clear light on the alarm system switches to alarm. Exterior fish market, rear side night. Charlie, Dina, and Napoleon climb through the window. Interior fish market counter night. A big counter full of ice. On it, many sorts of fish. Charlie, Dina, and Napoleon hasten to a counter. Charlie nods and they throw away the fish. Charlie buries himself in fish-free ice. He nods to Dina. I'm going to lead her to the light. Then I return and you bring me back. Just keep me fresh in between. How do we know you're back? Charlie shrugs. I will make my presence known. Somehow. Somehow? Are you fucking nuts? That's pretty vague for my taste. Obviously, I haven't been dead before, so what shall I say? I'll send you a postcard? Oh, would you be so kind? All that's missing in my fucked up life is a postcard from hell. Do not be alarmed. I believe we all together will drink the nectar of victory, and if not, would you be so kind as to say hello to my grandma? Tell her I'm fine, tell her I went back to school and got a degree in, well, something. I tell her her son's a ace con man. So is she. She will be so proud. <laughs> Charlie opens his shirt. Dina hits a switch on the <clears throat> defibrillator. It hums as it charges. Napoleon hands the pedals to Charlie. Dina, Napoleon exchange a long, nostalgic look. Eventually... Ah, what the hell? He fires. His body convulses. Nothing. He lies still. Oh, crap! It didn't work! Charlie realizes he slowly floats up to the ceiling while Dina and Napoleon continue to stare at his body buried in ice. It worked! Dina! It worked! Dina obviously doesn't see or hear him. She nudges his body. Oh, fuck. Charlie tries to move. He realizes he can zip effortlessly through the room. He bounces back and forth from wall to wall like an astronaut in a space station. Charlie zips over to a taxidermy mount of a white shark suspended below the ceiling. He looks down at Dina, smiles, and merges with the shark. With a jolt, the shark frees himself from its suspension cables and swims through the room as if in the ocean. Dina and Napoleon hear something stirring above them. They look up. The shark descends down on them like a dive bomber. The shark opens wide his mouth and bears multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth. 
Dina and Napoleon scream, turn, and run. The shark pursues them until the wall ends their flight. They stare into the wide open shark mouth until Charlie's head pops out between the teeth. This is not funny. Believe me, it is. Are you dead? I don't feel dead. Strange. I don't feel dead at all. I don't see any. Charlie's eyes glaze over. Not physically connected to the room, a light appears. In my expert opinion, he now sees the light. Remember you want to get rid of Emma and not join your ancestors in the internal hunting grounds. The light dim. That light is quite something. Napoleon points to Charlie's body on ice. If I were you, I would get on with your quest. It's profane and slightly vulgar, but your body will not keep fresh forever. Charlie nods and zooms away like a lightning bolt. He leaves an electric discharge in his wake. Interior of the house, pool night. Emma sits at the pool bar and sips a drink. A fiery lightning strike delivers Charlie. Hi, honey bun. How does it feel to be dead? Where is Helen? Honey bun, we're dead. We shouldn't meddle in the affairs of mortals. Charlie shoots a lightning bolt that catapults Emma off her bar stool. She splashes as a gush of water high into the air. The water collects in a little angry cloud. It shoots angry bullets of hail at Charlie. He shoots a lightning bolt that cooks the cloud into steam. The steam collects into Emma's shape back on the bar stool. Wow, honey bun, you're hot, sizzling hot. Throwing around little lightning bolts like Zeus. <laughs> How did you die? I peed into a plug. Charlie glances sideways to a light which glows beyond the confines of reality. It fades slowly. Did you see the light? No. Honey bun, you're looking at it right now. Don't worry, it'll grow dimmer and dimmer and then it'll just be gone. Where is Helen? <sighs> Maybe she's heading towards the light right as we speak. Charlie shoots a lightning bolt, but Emma turns into vapor and zooms away. Charlie squeezes off a couple more shots, but misses as Emma keeps moving. Emma returns fire with icicles. One hits Charlie and throws him into the pool. The pool boils over as electric discharges cook water that sprays around like volcanic geysers. With a shriek of pain, Charlie zooms into the air, but a hand of ice grabs his foot and holds him back. Dead or alive, you're no match for me. Charlie's electric discharges weaken as more and more ice encases his body. I think I put my honey bun into a little ice box. All you need is a little patience. And then you will forget all about the light and about the bitch. And then you and I, we will be together. You will be the world for me and I'll be the world for you. I don't do divorces and I don't share. Never have and never will. Suddenly, a force pulls Charlie out of his ice casing and drags him away. Interior, fish market, counter, night. Charlie materializes in the fish market. His body lies on the floor. Four police officers and Officer Steve resuscitate him. Dina and Napoleon watch in handcuffs. Charlie wants to zoom away, but he is drawn to his body as if it were magnetic. Officer number one puts defibrillator pedals on Charlie's chest. Clear! He fires. A sharp jolt draws Charlie almost totally back into his body. Again. The defibrillator charges. No! All jerk around and behold, open-mouthed, Charlie's bluish apparition. Officer number four faints. Don't do resuscitation. Is it not working? No, it does work. That's the problem. Emma has Ellen. I need time to find her. All I need are ten minutes and I bring her back. Please! Eventually, Steve nods. Thank you. Steve and the officers pack Charlie's body back in ice. Charlie zooms away in an electric rain of sparks. Exterior, the house, pool, night. Emma, as a half-solid vapor, hovers oscillating over the water. Charlie's fiery lightning bolt zaps right into the wallowing vapor with a supersonic boom. He arcs high into the sky. The vapor hurls around. It collects and pursues Charlie's electric trail of sparks. Exterior sky night. The lightning bolt and the vapor stream dog fight in the night sky. Emma hits Charlie. He veers off course. Exterior skyscraper night. Tumbling down, Charlie's bolt impacts into a building, sending lightning discharges down the facade. Emma follows him inside, leaving hissing white water in her wake. 
Interior, open plan office, night. Charlie's bolt races through a gigantic office, tearing through cubicle walls, casting furniture and paper into all directions. Electric discharges everywhere. Liquid Emma follows him like a tsunami, devastating what he has left intact. Exterior, skyscraper night. A gigantic wave shatters the glass facade. In midair, it boils down into half-liquid Emma torso on a wake of steam. She stops, hovers, and looks around. No Charlie anywhere. Exterior, skyscraper, roof, night. The roof door opens and Charlie emerges. He leisurely strolls to the edge and looks down. Below, he beholds steamy Emma slowly circling the building. Hey, Emma, you liquid little slut. The steamy vapor down below stops and looks up. Charlie bolts high up into the sky. Emma pursues, leaving a trail of water droplets. Exterior, power line night. A gigantic tower of an overhead power cable. Nearby, a big electric transformation station. High voltage power hums. City lights on the horizon. Charlie balances on the top power line. He rips a stabilizer from the tower and twirls it like an electrically overcharged saber. It sparkles and crackles. He thrusts and parries, lunges forward. Emma, the day of revenge is here. Emma swooshes down on the tower. You want me to come onto your turf? Afraid it could kill you? Emma gives him a mean smile. She grows a razor-sharp ice rapier. Charlie plays shocked and retreats a couple of steps down the power line. Emma follows slowly. When she steps onto the power cable, her liquid components boil. Steam sizzles as she follows Charlie. For the steam bath, I have to charge extra. Let me give you your change right now. They fight like swashbucklers. Charlie hacks away like a wild viking wielding a broadsword. Emma uses her icicle more like an elegant renaissance noble would stab with his rapier. Time and again, Charlie chops off Emma's point, but she always quickly regrows it. They lock blades. Emma's ice rapier grows and almost stabs into Charlie's eye. He has to let himself fall down to a lower power cable. Emma throws her icicle after him. He cuts the cable and swings like a pirate boarding an enemy ship. The icicle spear almost guts Charlie. Emma pursues with a regrown icicle rapier. They swashbuckle. Eventually, Charlie feints a move to lure Emma on the wrong foot. Emma takes the bait, tries to parry, but Charlie mercilessly runs her through. Emma convulses as electrical discharges shake her body. Steam cooks off and gushes into the air. Charlie increases the electrical discharge. Emma screams and falls down from the power line onto the transformation station roof. She tries to get up, but Charlie lands next to her. He hacks at her and deals her blow after blow, which leave her lying helplessly in a heap of sizzling steam and boiling water. Don't mess with the Charlie. He rams his flaming stabilizer sword into the concrete roof. Okay, that was that. And now? He trudges toward the distant, now relatively dim light that only barely connects to normal space. Where are you going? Told you. I have no unfinished business here. I'm dead, and now I'm going into the light. Emma slowly follows him. What about Helen? I gave my life for her. What more can she ask? I'm done. Dead and done. The light grows brighter. She is in Daddy's crypt. Charlie heads for the light. She might run out of oxygen. Don't you want to rescue her? Come on, I'll take you there. Charlie continues to nope. the light. No time. This light is gone soon. Can I come? I don't care. As Charlie strides toward the light, it gets quickly nearer and brighter. It swallows Charlie. Emma follows reluctantly. Exterior, Rivers Bend Day. A bright, sunny day in an idyllic landscape at the bank of a wide river. The other river bank is hidden by dust. Between the meadows, a small cobblestone path. It leads to a landing. At the landing, a boat and a ferryman in a dark hood. Charlie strides up to the landing. Emma follows reluctantly. He smiles happily. She looks afraid. Charlie waves, and the ferryman waves back. Exterior, the last landing. 
day. Charlie reaches the landing and approaches the hooded ferryman. The boat is already half filled with dead people. They look at Charlie expectantly. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Charlie. Hi. Charlie turns to the ferryman. Velvet darkness hides the inside of his hood. Is it okay if I join them? The ferryman extends a bony hand, demanding payment. Charlie searches his pockets. He finds nothing. Can you send me a bill? The ferryman shakes his head. Emma produces a credit card. I'm dead or alive. I'm never without plastic. Charlie hands a credit card to the ferryman, who pulls a scanner from the depth of his gown. You're coming? She nods. Two. One way. The ferryman slides the credit card. The machine has trouble finding a connection. The ferryman grunts angrily. Did you pay the bill? I didn't do the banking when I was alive, much less when I'm dead. Eventually, the card clears. The ferryman steps aside. Charlie helps Emma into the boat. Reminds me of the uh, harbor cruise we did way back in Singapore. Emma nods. They find seats. They stare into the dust. An elderly gentleman arrives at the landing. He pays the ferryman. While getting into the boat, he stumbles. Charlie jumps up and catches him. Thank you. No problem, Ralph. Hey, I know the guy's name. Emma forces a smile. Charlie sits again. His eyes wander nervously from the dust-veiled far side of the river to the back of a sign on the landing. The ferryman climbs graciously into the boat and moves effortlessly toward the rudder in the stern. Here we go. Charlie clenches his jaw. An old lady appears on the landing. Wait for me. She throws a coin. The ferryman catches it and nods. I'm afraid. The old lady has trouble getting into the boat. Charlie jumps up to help. Wait, I'll lift you down. Charlie climbs out and lifts the old lady into the boat. He looks at Emma. Their eyes lock. Suddenly, Emma jumps up, but Charlie kicks the boat into the stream. Emma furiously jumps out of the boat. Smack! She hits an invisible wall. A force restrains her. Sorry, my time has not come yet. Charlie turns the sign, which reads, No disembarking after the ferry has sailed. You screwed me, you bitch! Until death do you part, remember? That's now, in case you were wondering. Have fun. Hey, could you greet Napoleon's grandma? Tell her something nice about him. Doesn't matter what. She's used to lies. The ferryman turns the boat into the stream. The dust quickly swallows it. Charlie waves goodbye, looks at his watch, and hurries back. Interior, Crypt of Emma's dad, night. A dusty photo of Charlie and Emma adorns a withered wreath. Charlie, in the photo, blows the dust away and looks into the room. He spots Helen. She sits in the corner, unconscious. Charlie jumps out of the photo. He shakes Helen. He checks her breathing, feels her pulse. Helen! Helen! She stirs. Come back! She opens her eyes. She looks at him for a long time. He smiles. You look like shit. You won't look like spring chicken either once you're dead. You're a ghost? Just for the moment. Hopefully. We have to hurry. I have a rather important appointment. He takes her in his arms and they bolt back into the photo. Interior, fish market, counter, night. The officers, Steed and Dina, stare at Charlie's body. What does that mean? He makes his presence known? I don't know. He could make his presence known right now and you wouldn't know. I know. Charlie's lightning bolt crashes through a skylight with a supersonic bang. Among a shower of glass, he sets Helen down. Officer number four faints again. Charlie stares at Steve, Napoleon, and Dina. Beat. Now would be a good moment. Get him out. They grab Charlie's body and throw him on the floor. Dina rips his shirt open. Napoleon applies the defibrillator pedals. Clear! He fires. The jolt does not move Charlie closer to his body. Oh, God, that's not good. Officer Steve massages Charlie's heart. He does mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Oh, God. Now I have to go back to the ferry with the taste of his lips on mine. Napoleon applies the pedals. Clear! He fires. All stare at Charlie. Damn! Steve does resuscitation again. He massages his heart. Get into your fucking body. I would if I could. Do you think I like being dead? The light emerges again. Oh, God. What? The oh. light. 
Stay away from the fuck. Dee blows air into his lungs. Charlie stares into the light as it gets brighter. I think I have to go. If I wait too long, I won't find it again. Let me try. Helen kisses Charlie's mouth. They all stare at his body. Nothing happens. So much for fucking true love's kiss. I knew it was ball. Crank up the dial. It's now or never. Dina turns a knob on the defibrillator. Clear! He fires. A gigantic jolt pulls Charlie's gown goes back into his body. His breath rattles as it sets in again. He coughs and opens his eyes. I'm back. Interior. Concert hall. Backstage night. Dim backstage light. Elaborate stage technique. Stage hands making last equipment checks. Sound of thousands of fans clapping rhythmically. Charlie leans against a wall. Eyes closed. He listens. Full delight. Helen leans next to him. Now it's time for the star to shine. Roscoe dashes in. He looks scared. What now? It is scared. It won't come. It's locked itself in its dressing room. We'll have to cancel. Call him in again, and I will squeeze your nuts so hard that you can join a boys' choir. He's so sensitive since he bought this joint. I'll take care of him. He quickly descends down a corridor. He waves Helen to come with him. Interior, concert hall, corridor night. Charlie strides down a corridor. He almost collides with Dina and Napoleon, who suddenly emerge from a men's room. Dina looks a little exhausted. Napoleon zips his flying, gets his zipper stuck. It's not how it looks like. Of course not. We did a little exorcism to save the concert. That's so considerate. Charlie heads to a group of backstage people. They stare at a closed door with a big golden star. I need a bit of hands-on police work, please. Helen kicks down the door. Interior, concert hall, Gwen's dressing room night. Gwen, pale, full of sweat, sits before a big mirror and cries. Don't worry. Daddy will take care of you. Charlie grabs Gwen and drags him out of his dressing room. Gwen moans. Don't you worry about a thing. Interior, concert hall, backstage night. Charlie pushes Gwen onto the stage. The crowd explodes with delight as music sets in. The spotlight makes Gwen grow like a sunflower. Despair evaporates until he radiates pure charisma. Charlie goes back to his place, shuts his eyes, and taps his foot to the opening beats of his new song. When Gwen sings the first lyrics, the fans pick up the rhythm and clap. I like that sound. What about you? <laughs> I'm too old for that shit. The end.